That's Mike Hall from his new album, Nothing Stands Still. There's a good chance you've heard Mike playing bass for Pluto or maybe backing up Anna Coddington, SJD, Tammy Nielsen, or Dimmer. He's also part of that all-star group behind those Come Together shows. Now Mike steps out from the back line on this his debut solo album, produced by his buddy Joel Mulholland. We found Mike at home in Auckland and asked him how it feels to be a front man. I can't hold together much longer. <laughs> I haven't had time to really think about that actually. Uh, it's felt good. Um, you know, I did a I did a project uh, a few years ago that you were across the Night Choir project, which was like sort of a hybrid version of this where I had a bunch of songs that I'd written and I went to my trusted friends and we wrote them together under a band name and it wasn't wasn't a solo project but I think right. the seed of that idea was that it might have been a solo project at some point but it's just definitely turned into like a band so um the cool thing about this one is that it's just from the get-go been about what do I want to do and um so the feeling the feeling when I released it was like, I was actually quite elated that we sort of had done this thing under sort of zero pressure with right. quite low ambition and yet had quite high outcome. And then when people started saying they liked the record, I got to admit, I was quite, I was more chuffed than what I thought I'd be um, right. because the whole thing was done with a, yeah, the whole thing was like, I'm just going to make music that I, that I want to make uh, from a bunch of songs that I've got sitting around here. Yeah, and those bunches of songs, according to the story, the backstory, were songs that somehow you thought you had lost. Is that what, what what's going on there? Yeah. So <laughs> I had this. So I'm not that technical, technically minded, right? So this is. So I use. I, I still use this particular. Oh, I have one of those in my drawer somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's because of that. Maybe it's that's the thing. You can put it in a drawer, and it's got this orange covering, and you're like, oh, that's going to be okay. Yeah. Anyway, so um, the story is true. Yeah. So the story is that um that oh, the story of which is my life moment uh is that we're, i sort of write songs a little bit like um for fun so and i teach my family the same that i think that writing music is as accessible as playing a guitar or a ukulele, ukulele or a, a piano or whatever so um i think it's important to just write music for me because i enjoy it like sure. like somebody that enjoys playstation <laughs> and i would often um record those onto voice memos on my phone or more, more frequently onto Pro Tools as a sketch. Um, and it just so happened that over a sort of seven or eight year period, my last one of these, um, a friend of mine was like, oh, you're not backing up in the cloud. This is a few years back. And I yeah. said, no, I'm not using that yet. Yeah, You must get a backup. So I took this with me to PB Tech, a local tech uh, shop. And I was like, I need this input guy. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, sure, here's one. And then I came home, and um, I and as I as when I got home, yeah, when I got <laughs> home, I got a call from one of my kids saying, hey, Dad, I need help. So I, I never leave stuff in my car because I'm a musician, right? I've always got guitars. Yep, 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 yep. But it yep. just so happened that I would put them in my glove box, and I and I came in, I locked my car, and then I helped my daughter out, and then an hour and a half later, went to get them, and they were both taken. And, oh um, man yeah and it was uh oh man it was it was even just thinking about it now it was a serious that's horrible yeah it was serious loss um it reminded me of um so i played with i played with steve abel for a long time and he had a particular recording session uh go missing at one point in the ether when it was somebody thought they'd sent it and then they deleted it from their end yep. and he told me about that kind of feeling of loss and yeah. it was Oh, it was it was real so uh, yeah I'm sure so from that that step I, I just tried to remember as many as I could um over the next two or three weeks and um and cool cool in a cool uh te technology and capability kind of world yeah I had actually accidentally saved four songs in the wrong place and they were on my computer <laughs> <Nice one. laughs> and then accident. I went back <laughs> yeah and I went back into old voice memos yeah, there were there were about 70 sketches I, I guess a lot right. of them unfinished but they're, they're fun things to do you know? sure yeah, and so it's turned into whoops, this, <laughs> which yeah, the vinyl is great. It's fantastic, and oh, thanks, uh, man. yeah. So what on the album? What's are there any of those songs that you just talked about that are on the record? Which ones? Are yeah, there, kind of there are. Um, I would say of the songs, probably when we recorded, there's nine songs on the record. I think six or maybe seven of them are from the, that lost kind of world, right? Um, there's one song 
that I had a sketch for. I luckily found an old, old voice memo, and I, did, I didn't realise how old it was. I'd written this song in about late 2013, early 2014. It's a song called Goodwill on the record. Hey, why do you, why did you have to leave town? The sun is out. Why did you have to leave town? And it's, so it's a ten-year-old song, and I, I thought, I thought I'd written it twenty seventeen or something. But um, but yeah, that was quite interesting. Diving, trying to find bits and bobs, um, and then. Because, I, like I say, I'm writing music when I when I feel like it. Um, I I had a uh, I had been doing a lot of gigs with Brett Adams and Joel Mulholland, um, playing guitar yep. while I played bass, and yep. I decided those, to write. Uh, yeah, those covers things. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we do. Um, well, in a cool in a, in a cool kind of uh, I don't know turn of fortune. Um, I've played with both of those guys for the last I suppose fifteen years in various bands. Um, you know, and, and in fact, Brett Adams is a massive inspiration, as is Joel. Uh, Brett put his solo record out two years ago, which I think is a masterpiece, uh -huh. Black Clouds and Stereo album. Yep. Um, anyway, so those, and we do a lot of gigs either for Brett or for Joel. Joel's also written some of what I think are the greatest records to come out of this country um, under his name and under the Mots. Um, and we've been doing these jams where they would... I don't know, extended guitar jams, either in those shows where we do a legacy album or just jamming as friends. And so I wrote a song called, I had a sketch for a song called Time, which is a family oriented thing. And this, this riff, which just had a little extra bar of two, four in it. And I thought, I'm going to get Brett and Joel and we're just going to have a massive jam. And that's right. going to be the, yeah. <laughs> and so that song is on there. So there's a few cool newish ones. Yeah. Cool, cool, Maybe cool. Three. Yeah, and I, I, you do do a lot of work. I mean, the, there's the Pluto stuff, the come together stuff. You're you're playing with everybody, so you one might think that you'd want to have a break from all that and not go into that. But obviously, it's your passion. So, uh, is that what what is your life like with music? I mean, is it all the time? Are you thinking about it all the time? Yeah, I'm <laughs> thinking about it most of the time. I love it. It's it's a blessing. And it's a curse, I know it's a cliche, but like, um, I think once you get the bug and it's sort of like, it gets inside you like a fungus that grows and you can never quite cut it out. And there are times when, you know, it's financially difficult or it's, um, or it might be, you know, your ambition exceeds the output or whatever, and you, you want to maybe stop a little bit, but, you know, and I've tried, um, <laughs> sometimes and I can't, what is my, what do my days look like? I mean, so five years ago, I, I, I decided to tour a lot less. I, ha I had my, um, right, we're raising our oldest granddaughter, um, and it was a turning point. Did you say us. granddaughter? Yeah. So, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> yeah, one of my daughters had a baby when she was a teenager. She's had more since then. And so we took the first one. Um, Good on you. And, yeah, and I decided to tour a bit less. So I took a job at our performing rights organization, APRA. Um, yeah. So even when I tried to kind of, like, exit the music industry i stayed in the industry <laughs> um but um look man if, if i'm honest if i could just play bass every day and do gigs and sessions um like i, I mean i did that for 20 years yeah it was it was tough in terms of trying to make ends meet and time away from family um but if i could do it again and I, I probably would you know like it's for me i mean i've got it right beside me now right because i'm learning songs if, you know playing of course <laughs> just you know this is the thing that i love doing the most is, is is playing music yeah right so you are learning songs so i'm assuming that has something to do with the come together series what you're in the middle of uh, sergeant pepper is next is that right well it's funny you say that so i've learned those ones of course um, yeah. <laughs> you're on to the next um, one <laughs> yeah so um so yeah we've, we're doing sergeant pepper uh, so the Liberty stage, you know, where they pick a legacy album and yeah. then, uh, we, we, the band will get ready for a bunch of singers to come in and, um, and we, we, we try to go quite deep on that and, and, and tr well, that's why I've got the Rickenbacker, right? So, yeah, but I do yeah, play the Ricky that, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I play this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I play this a lot on my, on my songs. Um, so what I'm actually learning, to be honest, is I'm learning my tunes for a gig, a small gig I have up the road. Right, that's Freedom Art of Goal, right? 
Yeah, 300 meters from my house. It's Good great. idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can squeeze 50 people in there if you get lucky. <laughs> That's exactly what the capacity is. But I just didn't know if people were going to come. I just didn't have, like I say, my ambition was sort of like here. And, and I probably could have played somewhere 150 maybe, but... But yep. that's okay. I'm really looking forward to it. It'll, it'll be intimate and, and, and hopefully in a space like that, we'll have the room to have some sections for improv improvisation and, and just be in the moment and not, not really stick too much to the structure of some of the songs, given that nobody knows the songs. Well, some people will know them, but a lot of them are unknown. Yep. Uh, it could be quite a cool night. Yeah. Now, when I reviewed the album, I'm, I kind of compared some of it to uh, Andrew Bro's band Bike back in the 90s, the sound of it. And I was wondering if I was reaching uh, just kind of for whatever. But I spoke to another reviewer, and he had mentioned that he had the same thought. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, I'm wondering what you think of that. <laughs> I was flattered. I mean, really? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's not a record I own, but I remember when it came out, and I and I was a big Straight Jackets, Straight Jacket Fitz fan. Yeah. And in fact, when I I was in Dimmer for a while um, and did the second Dimmer record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Shane was, um, yeah, trying to keep that keep that wheel turning. Um, but when I first met Shane, you know, I was, I don't want to say I was starstruck, but I just had this huge respect because for me as a teenager, a lot of that music was quite pivotal from a local sense. So the Straight Jacket Fits, the Chills, the Clean, um, and, then I, and then some other local... Um, local bands as well, mixed with the world of punk rock gave me a feeling that it was obtainable and it was possible for people like me to consider playing music and doing it well and properly. And also starting, you know, when I saw the Ramones, it was like, okay, well, I don't need a lot of chords to be able to make write a cool song yep. and have people appreciate that. So, and it's the same. And with Strategic It Fits, there was a sophistication and with Bruff and with Bike as well. A sophistication around that sort of note choices in pop music how you can actually write a melodic um pop infused track that still has uh i don't know it hasn't really got the shiny edges but it's got the shiny melody it can right. still be it can, it can still have some sort of identifiable new zealandness about it or some it, some just some real coolness about it uh, that sounds like a, it's the no, same that's as exactly right it's interesting because i just interviewed a band called the softies who were around in the 90s and uh, they just got their first album now out in like 30 years or something, you know, another one of those things. And they, they sat, they're American duo, female duo. And I'm listening to that, I'm going, they had to have listened to some of that stuff. And sure enough, I, when I'm talking to them and they were like devastated that Martin Phillips had just passed away and how much that scene that sound affected them over there. So it's, it's really amazing how that spreads throughout and stays with people. So you, what you're doing is it matters, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's cool to hear that, isn't it? When we hear that kind of influence. And I think like, you know, it, it's, it was also when we had a small, a New Zealand without the internet and we had, it was hard to get records here Yeah, and you'd hear stories or see reviews and like, any me or hear stories of the clean doing well on college radio yeah. or the chills touring the States. It was like this sort of like, next level when you're like wow this is this is meaningful and i think that you know there was a there was a time in new zealand the flying that that for me the clean boodle 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 was like that album was i was the young man that came out and i, yeah. I wasn't even 10 and i discovered it at like 14 and i just <laughs> thought it was <laughs> yeah it was like this cool thing i, I discovered it at the same time that i discovered husker do and 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 the clash right Right. Um, well, I just talked to Martin or Bob Mould the other day. <laughs> oh, amazing. So yeah, it is quite cool that that stuff went 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 further. Um, you know, we were we were ordering records from overseas of, of artists that that maybe they felt the same way. I mean, I, I had yep. a really cool experience. Um, uh, 14, 10, 2010, I went to um, I went to New York for a, to see a friend of mine, and I met um, the singer from Gorilla Biscuits, Siv. And the, you know, 80s hardcore band that I just loved, right? <laughs> and I sat, and he actually gave me a tattoo, and he's a tattooist, and um, <laughs> punished him for like an hour or so. Like, did you know that we listened to your music, and it was so pivotal for us, and this is what we did? And even him, who had, he had, he then toured here a few years later, they kind of re got back together. Yeah. But he was also similarly like, you know, we had didn't really have any idea that 
yep. people in New Zealand will be listening to our music and yep. it was quite cool. No, like it was the same kind of thing the other way around. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, it was really awesome. Yeah, I just watched the film Head South, which is about the Christchurch scene in like 79, 80. And, you know, it kind of, it's based on true stories, of course. And it's, uh, you know, there's a great scene in there where this kid, he's like 16, he wants to learn how to play bass. And he goes to his record store. The guy in, behind the counter is a couple of years older, knows everything, and he's got imports. And he's like trying to, he's selling him a public image limited, the first single, and he's the buzzcocks and all this stuff and telling him all about it. And he's just like soaking it all up, you know? And sure enough, I mean, I was doing the same thing at the same time back in this uh, in 79, you know? So it's a universal thing that happens to people who suddenly get connected with this music. And, and I think the punk thing, like you say, it really helped. It made you feel like anybody could do it. Yeah. I mean, there's something wonderful about being able to listen to whatever you want to listen to now. Right. And yep. I don't want, I don't ever want to be like that. We can all look back and roll with rose tinted glasses, I suppose. <laughs> but at the same time, there was that record store culture where we'd be like, okay, well it's Saturday. So I yep. just, I'm, I go to the record store and I go to cross bass records. Yep. I see those guys. I listen to a seven inch that I can't afford. And then I, you know, <laughs> there's only one of it or, or I go to groovy and I look at, and I choose my two records that I'm going to buy. Yep, yep. And then I go to my friend's house and he has two different ones. And we've got a package arriving Wednesday from Revelation Records with the latest release from such and such. That culture was pretty cool. You know, yes. like yeah. there's, yeah, it, it was, it's, it's great now too. I mean, I, I just love the fact that my kids can be like, what's this band dad? And I'm like, have a listen. <laughs> You know? <laughs> Excellent. That's fantastic. Yeah. And of course, the solution to that is once you get old enough to get a job, you get a job at the record shop. So you get a discount. All over. You spend <laughs> your entire salary on records. <laughs> yeah. We've all had friends like that. Was that you, was it? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yes. Uh, so, so with the, I mean, so I'm interested in with doing the come together thing. I mean, one minute you're in U2, the next minute you're in Led Zeppelin, then you're in the Beatles pretty much. And you guys really pull it off. Um, so as as the bass player in all this, I mean, what, what does that do to your head? Do you have to like rethink kind of how to play and who, what you're playing and who you're playing with? Yeah, uh, I mean that's another great question. <laughs> like that's the attraction to it is the, what you've just talked about is the attraction to it. So <laughs> to to go from being in the kind of Adam Clayton world to yeah. then being into Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, first, I, I suppose, first of all, the, the kind of preface to all this is that I didn't grow up playing covers. You know, I started as a sure. yep. as a young guy playing saxophone, and although we the covers we play would be jazz standards and and all that kind of stuff. So then going into this punk rock land, I was almost probably a bit anti that kind of stuff, right? Of course. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to. There's the whole play point. Over. Yeah, we're gonna although the Ramones did some decent covers, but they were all obscure things from the '60s. <laughs> yeah, well, well, and in your punk rock band, you know, you, we used to play. What do I get? And, yeah. Um, you know, or we'd play these boots are made for walking or something like that. Oh, but we'd never go. My band to, did that too. <laughs> yeah, what a tune! Hey, if you're a bass player, I mean, it's the one, right? Um, and then I suppose, like, um, you know, like, yeah. Anyway, so so this kind of opportunity came around in twenty, almost ten years ago, where Garth Hudson came to New Zealand, and right. yeah, and Simone put a thing together. I remember for, that. Yeah. Yeah, the fortieth anniversary of the last waltz, and it was a massive challenge. Yeah, I mean, playing with Garth Hudson from the band is like the ultimate, right? It's, yeah. I mean, even now, I just <laughs> um, so when this legacy thing came up, and I was doing these albums, and with my friend Joel as the musical director, um, I suppose we bought in because of the people and because of the music, and we were like, "Hey, this would be cool." And there have been times where we've steered away from the originals quite a lot, and other yeah. times where we've adhered to it. But for me. It's got easier to learn songs over time a little bit. I've got a, a way that my brain seems to absorb certain motifs. I focus on what's important and what's not. And um, in, in my own opinion, I discuss it with Joel and we kind of work out our way through. And then to be fair, what happens is that you might be playing an artist that you really don't like maybe, or you mm -hmm. like the U2 thing was, I was never really a U2 fan, right? So, right. Um, so opening that door, and opening the U2 door up and going, here's some U2 Zeropa. And I mean, I knew some of the earlier stuff that was in that sort of um, almost sort of uh, new ordery Joy Division sounding world. Um, but yeah, I, once I learned it, I loved it. I was like, oh, this is quite cool, you know? Like, um, So if you go in with an open mind, and for me, the first thing I'm trying to think of is what is the what is the imprint? What is the impact of the bass? Because I'm a bass player. It's like, what's yep. what's the kind of primary 
role here in these songs. Generally, it's always about foundation, but obviously there's different ways to, to orchestrate or different melodic impact. Yep. Um, so when we did Led Zeppelin 4, for example, <laughs> after the U2 one, which is a big change, <laughs> yes. it was for the Led Zeppelin stuff, it was about going into lots of live recordings and yep. trying to really get inside the workings of John Paul's playing as a live performer. Yeah. Whereas Paul McCartney is about the specific note choices at specific moments. Um, so, and although there is a bit of that in the John Paul Jones world, you know, it was more for me about watching a whole bunch of stuff and then picking my favorite pieces or my favorite, the attitude in those live performances. So it's a luxury, man. And then, and then to play them in front of like sold out audiences to play these songs in front of sold out audiences with all my friends. Yep. It's quite surreal, you know? Yeah. And, and they're really supportive of projects like this. Like they've been hugely supportive of this record. So yeah, well, really got, cool. you pretty much got the band on, right? Joel's here and Brett's here and uh, Alex. Yeah. And, so that's very cool. And yeah, I, yeah. I got to say, when you, I've watched a lot of the Come Together shows and I really felt that when the U2 one came, which they're not my favorite band either, but I don't dislike them. But as a band, you guys really gelled as a band on that, on that one. And then... The Led Zeppelin one was just out there. I mean, you nailed it. <laughs> I saw Led Zeppelin post uh, John Bonham, and they were terrible. Jimmy Page was <laughs> drunk, you know, blah, blah. <laughs> but you guys were better. <laughs> maybe we feel more, um, maybe we feel more weight than those guys do, you know, like, because they're like, oh, it's our music. And we're like, we have to give reverence to this incredible yeah. collection of tunes. Thank you. That's really kind. I mean, we work, <laughs> we work really hard on the day, and, and sure. like, we do a lot of practice in our own time and then we get together for three rehearsals and then we play the shows. And right. I think there is something, and this is why these guys are on the, on the record and why we've done, like I say, I mean, I've done so I've done a number of records with Joel, number of records with Brett. Um, I think after, and Alistair, after time, Alistair and I talked about this, there's like a, Alistair, yeah. the relationships are as important as the, um, you know, the trust and the relationship is as, as important as playing the right notes. Yeah. Um, so we've developed a, a way we play together and it just so happens that um, it's happened in that kind of like legacy yeah. world now. Um, yeah. But I think there's other opportunities. I hope that we all write, make other music and do, yeah. other, do other shows, you know. So you're thinking along we, those terms, what's next for you as a solo artist now? It's funny, man. I'm, I'm not. It's quite, I mean, I'm just still writing music. Uh, right. I, I'm, I'm trying to be really in the moment. I used to have that kind of like step by step thing, but the reason this has been so fun is because there's been no deadline. There's been no, I want to get a song on here. There's been none of that. And I think I've got lots of other cool things going on. So I'll put this record out. And then if I have time to do another one at some stage, I'll do another one. Um, equally, if I'm trying to encourage people like Matthias and yeah. others and all those guys that you talk about on the record to keep making music and I want to play their music. I want to be on stage with those guys or in the studio with them making yep. their tunes. You know? cool. So are you storing your stuff on the cloud now? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, there's only one of these and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, yeah. this is, yeah, the other stuff is, I mean, maybe I should even stop using, I don't know, uh, but um, yeah. In it's, several places is best because you can't count on anything. <laughs> I mean, that's why I pressed the vinyl too, right? It's like, oh, man. Um, yeah, that was quite a lesson. Like I, I'm in a place of, like I'm smiling now thinking about it. Right. But, but there are still honestly about, I remembered about maybe half of the kind of sketch. And I say the sketches, right? So yeah. some of them might just be a guitar with a with a melody or, uh, actually a lot of them had lyrics because Sean Donnelly, um, SJD Sean, who, because I play in the SJD band, of he told me about this writing exercise um, a few years back, like 30 songs in 30 days. Oh, yeah. And and you, you just write for the sake for, to write. Yeah. And I tried it and I could never do more than nine days or 10 days. Um, but he said that one of the most important things is to get some lyrics down and not just have oohs and ahs. And, and, he, and he was like, also don't write the same lyric that you always write. Like pick something that you can see like a door handle or a fridge or something and write a lyric. And so a lot of the songs on those sketches ha actually had lyrics too, which is yeah. unusual for me. Um, but I remembered about maybe just over half. So, I mean, it's not going to turn up, but if, <laughs> even though it was a joke and it was in the publicity, if the hard drive did turn up, I reckon I could yeah. fish yeah. out another five or six <laughs> tunes for sure.
What do you think about uh, Troy Kingy doing those 10 albums in 10 genres in 10 years? That's ambitious, isn't it? <laughs> That's the word. Yeah. So Troy's amazing. I, I mean, he's a, Troy's a friend of mine too. And um, I filled in for a gig. In fact, I didn't do a great job because I was a little bit, I remember we were, we were a little bit under, under rehearsed. Right. And the wind, wind a, a smoke machine blew my charts off the stage because oh, I had to man, chart I some stuff. <laughs> um, that's but when Marika, yeah, Marika was ha- the bass player was um, on like t- away right for, fa- for looking after family and and uh, I think for the tour it was like okay Mike we need you to be available for these shows because Marika can't do them this gig is this record this gig is this record this gig is a combination of these so I learned like 40, oh 40 something <laughs> tunes and at that time I was like yeah this is. I mean, he does have some particularly Troy things, which I sure. very much respect, like some really interesting chord changes that he, that seem to cross genre. Yeah. Um, but I just respect the, uh, yeah, I really respect the guy because he's, he's kind and he's um, productive and writes wonderful lyrics as well. And, you know, and he's, he's on this, he's on this mission. I also really appreciate Troy's confidence. Yep. And to, to, to do that, to, yep. to, to yep. go out and be like, I'm going to give, I'm going to give this a crack and, yep. and just be who he is. Yeah. yeah. He's up to number eight and it's a pretty wild record. So yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll yeah. wrap up with one bad question. Your favorite bass player of all time and why? <laughs> okay. Ooh. Okay. Um, right. Oh man, that's so hard. See. Cause I've got, <laughs> And I, am I only allowed to say one person? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. After my recent experience, right now, my favorite bass player is John Paul Jones. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And the reason why is because he is a songwriter, so he's got the melodic, right? But he's got the, he he he's got he had a unique approach to playing the instrument to fit the song he was um inventive when he needed to be inventive and that might have been as much on the rhythm side uh, as it was on the melody side um and he understood the dynamic of three instruments in a four-piece band so right. sometimes he might have had to step into that kind of rhythm guitar role yep and he um did it with yeah, there's an element of humility. And quite a bit in the of keyboard right. stuff too with him. Isn't it? Yeah, and the keyboard stuff. Yeah, but there's, yeah. ele- there's elements of humility in his playing, and I think technically, um, for me, technically, he's just so. I had to work so hard on becoming, being better. Um, he's at a sort of level that, uh, yeah, it's I can will can always continue to aspire to. I mean, there's plenty of others, but at the moment, I'm totally in that zone. And if I sit down, no, that and cool. want to. If I want to get better, I, I'll, I'll play a Led Zeppelin tune. And it's interesting because he's kind of the un, the least talked about member of Led Zeppelin, obviously. Everybody else has a larger-than-life image. He's the guy, the quiet guy that nobody talks about, but he's probably the one that's holding everything together, similar to what you probably do as well with all the Oh, that's projects. kind. So. Mate, I, well, that's another reason why he's really endearing, right? It's yeah. like, it's exactly it. I, I think that there's a certain thing about bass players. Paul McCartney might be the exception, but, yeah. you know, we, we quite like not being, you know, this is uncomfortable for me to be on the cover of an LP. We quite like right. being in the team, locking it in with you, providing the foundation, being sober yeah. until you finish the gig. You know, like we want to be in that zone. I don't know how sober he was, but <laughs> it's like, Relatively it, it's sort sober. of, <laughs> yeah, like, and if people don't know who you are, like, I love it when I get off stage and people are like, were you great? <laughs> I love it. Great, key, great keys. And I'm yeah. like, thanks, man. That's great. Yeah, right if on. I've done it and we've got it through and it doesn't matter if people know who I am or not. I, I just, in fact, one thing I find very uncomfortable is when we do introductions, often in those come together shows, they go around, they say, and on this is and they get to me and it's Mike Hall. And I'm like, oh, thank you. And I try and I think, you know, and it's like, yeah. but it's just inside. I'm like, people don't need to know my name. Yeah, I just right. want to do my, I just don't want to do this job, you know? Yeah. I'm glad you're doing it. It's excellent. You guys are, yeah, everything. I love it all. It's just, you know, especially these days, it's just great to hear this stuff and your stuff as well and everything you're doing. So congratulations and thank you. Thanks, Marty. I appreciate taking the time and thank you for your support of this album. It's it's cool, man. It's no problem. And good luck with the show at uh, Frida. You may need a bigger venue though, I think. Thanks. (laughs) Loiter around outside. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. See ya. If you enjoyed this episode of the 13th Floor's Music Talk series, 
please be sure to subscribe to the website or to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook or Instagram and wherever you find your podcasts. There's a whole lot more to discover. 